just go ahead. Um, yeah, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Sean Peters. Um, uh, Sean um, got his uh, bachelor's in electrical engineering uh, from Rice University and then completed a master's uh, and post uh, PhD at Stanford um, and then completed um, a year at Lincoln Labs at MIT um, and uh, has gone on to um, be assistant professor uh, now at the Naval Postgraduate School. And he, he works and he'll be talking about this really, really cool technique of uh, using natural sources um, for, for doing um, radio, um, basically radar work uh, in a way that's uh, reminiscent maybe of uh, seismology using earthquake sources. But I'll, I'll let Sean get started on, on this, but I'm looking forward to a really interesting talk. Thank you, Duncan. So yes, I'm very excited to share my work in developing passive radar sounding. And I'm gonna talk about application for both terrestrial glaciology as well as planetary radio glaciology. Uh, I'm coming from the Neil Postgraduate School, but I also have done, it's not working. For some reason it's not going forward. There we go. Okay, so I've also done work as a radar engineer and instrument scientist at the MIT Lincoln Lab. And then before that, I was at Stanford University, advised by Dustin Schroeder, which many of you know. Uh, in Dustin's group, I got to uh, go to Greenland multiple times for three different field seasons to test a variety of active radar, bisatic radar systems, and then develop and test the passive radar system that I'm going to talk about today. But before I begin my talk, uh, coming from the Neil Postgraduate School, I couldn't get away without showing at least one example of a Navy radar system developed in the early 1930s for applications in World War II. Uh, since 1930s, radar has been used for transmitting powerful electromagnetic signals to detect targets of interest for early warning detection. But since World War II, radar has been an invention that has truly changed the world and adapted and extended to study the environmental system, both on Earth and other planetary systems. For example, radar has been used to look at sea ice, monitor changes in the atmosphere and weather system, looking at the biosphere and monitoring tree water content, as well as looking at space-based and planetary systems. But for the focus of this talk, I'm gonna majorly talk about the cryosphere and how we use radar to study the glaciers, ice sheets, and ice shelves around the world. So why is this important? When we think about one of the greatest challenges that our society will face in the next century, it really is the contributions of ice sheets to sea level rise. But there's a great deal of uncertainty in sea level rise projections. If we look out to the year 2100, you can see there's a wide range of uncertainty in sea level rise projections. And it's important that we can advance technologies that can observe the processes, conditions, and physics that govern ice sheet behavior in order to improve these projections, because this is a number that will impact the lives of millions of people. So when we think about how we currently, as glaciologists, look at these ice sheet and the technologies that we use to understand ice sheets, one of the main techniques is airborne radar sounding that can monitor conditions within and beneath the polar ice sheets. So on the left, I'm showing an example of an ra airborne radar system that has multiple flight lines over, for example, Antarctica. You can see the blue flight lines over the Antarctica radar profile coverage. And these airborne radar systems transmit a powerful electromagnetic pulse and then receive the echo coming from both the surface and subsurface features such as uh, and glacial layers, as well as the bedrock beneath the ice sheet. Looking in a little bit more detail of an anatomy of an airborne radar sounder measurement, this is an example uh, demonstrated by Riley Kohlberg, who was a former lab mate. You can see the airborne radar system transmitting its powerful electromagnetic pulse. And you can see the multiple layers as well as the bed where you can see the scattering from the bottom. An example of what the received waveform might look like and then how these can be aligned in what's called as a radar gram, where you can see the bright surface feature as well as in glacial layer features and strategy, stratigraphy, as well as the bedrock. And you can look and see the bedrock topography beneath the ice sheet. So airborne radar sounding is a very powerful tool for studying ice sheets at a very large spatial scale. Now, while it can provide an extensive spatial coverage, oftentimes it's limited temporally to a snapshot in time. These airborne radar flight lines are often done uh, you know, once, maybe they're repeated over multiple field seasons, but this map of Antarctica SERP surface that can be generated by combining all these radar flight lines is something that is considered a snapshot in time. And if we consider about 
the processes and conditions that are evolving on not just a seasonal scale, but a monthly or daily scale, it's important that we have continuous observations that can enable us to better understand those evolving conditions. So another technique that radio glaciologists like to use are these stationary ground-based radar systems that can provide these nearly continuous observations, but can only do so at a single location. On the right, I'm showing an example of a radar profile that's using an array-based system to track the changes in the internal layers, as you saw right there, as well as the changes in the bed echo return power. And this can tell us valuable information, again, about this involving in glacial system on a daily time scale. Now, another issue with these stationary ground-based radar systems, in addition to being only a single location, is that if you were to deploy a system and then come back a year later, because these systems are exposed to such extreme conditions, you might come back and find that your system has actually uh, you know, been introduced to a crevasse that's opened up right underneath it. Now, of course, the data in this case was right here, and we had to go and extract that data, of course, to try to identify uh, you know, what was happening with the crevasse opening. But it was a very fun task to do that. So looking at now this radar system that for airborne sounding can provide extensive spatial coverage, but is limited temporally to a snapshot time, and on the other hand, we have these ground-based radar systems that can provide these nearly continuous observations that can only do so at a single location. In both cases, these existing radars are resource intensive in terms of cost, power, size, and logistics for continuous monitoring and long-term monitoring at the ice sheet scale. In both cases, they're fundamentally limited by the need to transmit their own powerful electromagnetic signal. And so that's where my work is coming in, where I'm developing a low resource passive radar technique that eliminates the need to transmit a signal, instead re receives ambient radio emissions, such as the sun's radio signals. I'll also talk about examples of other radio signals that we can try to exploit to provide these temporal and spatial observations of ice sheets, ice shelves, and glaciers. The technique works by receiving the direct path from your ambient radio source, as well as the path that propagates through the ice, reflects off the bed, and then is received a delay time later then using an autocorrelation based technique, and of course, cleaning up the signal due to any radio frequency interference, you can extract a direct sun signal as well as a sun echo and use the relative delay time to map to an ice thickness measurement, which is really important for reducing those sea level rise projections. And then using the relative amplitude between the direct sun signal and the sun echo, you're able to get an estimate of either the attenuation or the reflected power losses that are coming from inside the ice sheet. Now, before I show the results from an ice sheet, I wanna first show the experimental progression of how this technique was developed, starting at a sea cliff where the ocean surface acts as a mirror wave for the sun's radio waves. And if uh, there's no medium, there's no scattering, and it's an ideal test case for passive radar sounding. Then moving to a Death Valley experiment where a rougher surface echo is more analogous to an ice sheet bed reflection. Finally, moving to an ice sheet where I'll show the results of field testing at Spoil Glacier to measure ice thickness using the sun as a signal. And then finally, I'll talk about the implications for this for planetary sound, sounding um, and, and uh, propose the design and analysis of a passive HF radar that uses Jupiter's radio emissions for different mission concepts, such as studying Europa's icy shell. And in each case, we're looking at this passive autocorrelation based technique that extracts the amplitude and delay time of the sun's echo. So going back to the Sea Cliff experiment and why we even thought this technique was possible, we first go back to a historical Sea Cliff done in the 1950s by a group of radio astronomers, where they observed the interference pattern of the sun's power as its sun, as its sun angle changed throughout the entire day. So very similarly, measuring the direct ray as well as the reflected ray and the total power received at the instrument, you're able to see an interference pattern that corresponds to fringes that map to the height of the cliff that you're measuring. Now, this is a measurement that takes the order of minutes, even hours, to get an accurate measurement of your uh, detection ranging profile. So we want a measurement that could happen on the order of seconds or even microseconds. And we move to an autocorrelation-based technique where this peak in the autocorrelation is occurring at a microsecond delay time between the sun's line of sight ray as well as a reflected ray off of the ocean. Now, this is a simulated result but I'll show how we can clean up our signal to get something that looks like this. 
Because if you were to naively go out to Big Sur, which is what I did in the first case, and look at what this autocorrelation might look like, you would see multiple echo peaks in the autocorrelation resulting from radio frequency interference. Where on the top, you're seeing the spectrogram of the received measurement, and you see these powerful radio sources coming from things like FM radio stations, TV stations, that are much greater than the background power of the sun. So there are additional steps in this processing technique than just going from the digitized sun signal to the autocorrelation signal. I have to show how we can remove the radio frequency interference and then use spectral stitching techniques to increase our effective bandwidth and improve our range resolution. So looking at the radio frequency interference on the left, I'm showing an example of the simulated spectrum of what we'd expect for our measurement, as well as the autocorrelation in an ideal test case where there's no radio frequency interference. You can clearly see the echo peak in the autocorrelation function. Now, as you introduce this radio frequency interference, as I showed before, you can see that this corrupts your autocorrelation measurement and you're no longer able to receive that echo peak. But after you use a thresholding technique based on the two key criteria for anomalies uh, in an exponential <laughs> um, power distribution, you can actually abstract an echo peak as before. And this is much faster than saying using notch filtering or sine wave subtraction. So this is a much more computationally efficient technique for again, removing the RFI and extracting the echo peak in the autocorrelation function. Another technique was the spectral stitching. So on the left, I'm showing the full case where you have your band limited echoed white noise source as a simulation. And then on the bottom, I'm showing the echo peak that we can clearly resolve. In the middle, if you're to only consider a subband of your echo, uh, received echo, then you wouldn't be able to resolve this peak because your bandwidth is not sufficient. But because we're receiving white noise, you can step independently through your center frequency, very similar to what's done for step frequency radar to abstract the echo peak. Where again, this echo peak is really important for again, observing the relative power as well as ranging profiles, which will map to an ice thickness measurement once we get there. So now that I looked at all the challenges and solutions for radio frequency interference, which I know how to remove using filtering techniques, reducing the size of the autocorrelation main lobe, using spectral stitching for increasing the effective bandwidth and improving our range resolution, and something that I'm not talking about, but the fact that the thermal noise is actually greater than the sun power, but we can use coherent summation in order to increase our signal to noise ratio. So with this, we are ready to go back and test our passive radar sounding device. One last thing we did before going actually was using a loopback test to simulate what it would be like to receive a white noise source with the sun with our system. So in this loopback setting, we transmitted a white noise source and an echo, attenuated it down to the power of the sun level, used our amplification chain to bring it back up above the noise floor, and then receive it with our software-defined radio. In this case, you can see the autocorrelation function, and we can see a very clear peak in the autocorrelation function which means that we can use our software to find radio and receiver chain to extract the sun's reflected echo peak. So now demonstrating the Seacliff experiment, we use this at Big Sur to show that we can extract an echo peak at the expected delay time, corresponding to roughly 83 meters, where the red line is the Google Earth height of the cliff of roughly 84 meters. And again, this was the mirror case where the ocean surface acts like a mirror for the sun's radio waves. So the next step was to move on to a rougher surface echo coming from uh, Death Valley, which is more analogous to the ice sheet bed reflection. Looking at the passive experiment setup, it's set up on the side of a cliff at Dante's Peak, receiving the direct path as well as the echo that comes off of the desert floor. The system hardware in this case is using a 15 megahertz bandwidth, eight seconds of integration time, centered at 330 megahertz, these parameters were chosen because they're ideal for uh, monitoring glaciers using ice penetrating radar systems. You'll notice that the front end gain is very significant because we're receiving a very weak uh, sun signal and we need multiple stages of amplification to bring it back above the noise floor of our digitizer. So showing some results from the Death Valley experiment, where again, we're trying to extract a rough surface echo. You can see the sun, its direct path, and then a reflected path off the desert floor. I was able to extract an echo peak in the autocorrelation that corresponds to the height of the cliff, where the red lines here show any uncertainty due to the change in the sun's elevation angle, the height of the cliff, and the local slope of the Death Valley floor. 
Now, there are some additional insights from this Death Valley field testing because we have a moving sun reflection point. So we can actually watch the sun reflection change, and this will create a change in range measurement, which will be important for demonstrating the utility of this technique on a glacier. Showing the examples of some of the detected changes in range of the sun's echo, you can clearly, clearly see in this case the autocorrelation at one time, received an echo peak that corresponds to roughly 3.3 microseconds, and then at a different time where we're receiving an echo peak corresponding to roughly 5.9 microseconds, where again, the red line shows any uncertainty in the delay time based on the sun's estimated elevation angle, the high of the cliff, and the local slope of the Death Valley floor. Another technique that we wanted to try to implement is two-dimensional image formation. So in addition to receiving the sun signal, we use something called the batches algorithm for passive radar, where we take our received signal, segment it into smaller chunks, and then perform that same cross-correlation or autocorrelation and filtering techniques that I showed before. You can then stack these range lines shown here and take a direct Fourier transform in the azimuth direction to obtain a range Doppler image, which will be really important for demonstrating passive star imaging in the future part of my talk. So to summarize this two-dimensional imaging, I was showing that we can use the sun as our signal of opportunity, and we can use this technique with a single antenna to estimate the autocorrelation via FFT computation. Showing what this looks like, on the left, I'm showing the real aperture radar image, and on the right, I'm showing the unfocused radar image, and I'm now gonna show the impacts of increasing our integration time. And as we would expect, as we increase our integration time from 0 0.25 to 0 0.5 to one to two seconds, this improves the signal and noise ratio of our measurement, even though it would impact the resolution of your azimuth direction. But this is really important for showing that this technique can work and also can be used for detecting changes in the reflectivity of the sun's echo as it traverses across range lines. So here I'm plotting the, the reflected power of the echo peak because the reflected power that we received is a convolution of the sun signal with the ground reflectivity, which is showing here that we can detect changes in reflectivity, which again will be really important when we try to go and monitor ice sheets. Looking at detecting now changes in the sun's echo, this will be important for demonstrating passive synthetic aperture radar imaging. So because we have a moving sun reflection, you can actually track the phase of the autocorrelation echo peak in, and use this to monitor very minute changes in the range uh, positioning. So again, this monitoring of the phase and being able to recover the phase history is very important for being able to show passive synthetic aperture radar imaging. All right, so now that I show that this can work in the Death Valley field setting, we were ready to now go test this on ice sheet in Store Glacier to measure ice thickness, again, using the sun as our signal of interest. Here's an example of the experimental setup uh, near the campsite, just getting everything ready and showing it now uh, isolated sitting on the surface of the ice sheet, measuring the sun's direct path, as well as the path that propagates through the ice sheet, reflects off the bed, and is received a delay time later. Using the same autocorrelation based technique that I just described, we show that we could extract an echo peak at roughly 10.1 microseconds, which corresponds to a 1000 meter ice thickness measurement which we validated using both a Greenland ice sheet model, as well as active radar measurements test site near the survey. Uh, so here's showing the, in these red lines, any uncertainty due to the range of profiles used by both of those measurements. Looking at some more system checks on the left, I'm showing the statistics of our received signal, showing that indeed they match white noise, which is what we expect, as well as the histogram of the power spectral density showing that it matches this exponential distribution, which is again what we should expect. We also modeled the expected power spectral density for, <laughs> for the voltages of the sun, the galactic background noise, and the low noise amplifier in the system as a whole to ensure that the amount of integration time that we used was sufficient for detecting the sun's echo peak, which it was in this case. More results showing the effects of the radio frequency interference removal. On the top, I'm showing the measurement before we applied the radio frequency interference removal technique. And on the bottom, I'm showing our passive sounding measurement after using radio frequency interference removal to show how this indeed cleans up our signal, removes those extraneous echo peaks, and isolates the sun's echo peak very clearly in this case. Another technique we used, which I alluded to before, was the use of coherent summation to improve the echo peak SNR, 
Here, the different color lines correspond to different measurements. And then on the bottom is the coherently summated result showing a very clear peak in the autocorrelation function at the expected delay time. So now that I showed that this is possible, one of the key questions going forward was, what is the extent of passive sounding spatial and temporal coverages? When we think about Greenland and Antarctica, there are multiple regions where there's increasing mass loss or there's in glacial water storage or properties of interest that we're interested in discovering and looking at in great detail. So it's important that we have accurate performance uh, characteristics of passive radar so that we know where this can be most useful. So one way we started by projecting passive soundings performance is by considering all the losses from an attenuation model, the, reflect, the reflection losses, transmission losses, as well as including the gains from thinking about the maximum integration time for a particular point on the ice sheet. So here I'm showing the expected signal noise ratio for the Stor Glacier test site, where if you were to use the maximum integration time, you could obtain an SNR of roughly 24 dB again, using this type of model. So showing one example of the Greenland signal and noise ratio for three times of year, the summer equinox and the winter equinox, where the color shows the signal and noise ratio. And again, a signal and noise ratio of greater than 10 dB is desirable for measurements. You see in the winter case, a lot of region is blue, which makes sense. The sun is below the horizon. And of course it wouldn't be able to be used in Greenland during that time of the year. But you can see in the summer and equinox, that a, a large region of the ice sheet is on the table in terms of being able to use passive sounding for ice sheet measurements. Showing this result for Antarctica subsurface, I'm showing the SNR on the left for the summer case, and then the equinox case on the right. I don't show the winter case because Antarctica is completely blue for the winter, but again, this color is showing the signal and noise ratio, where again, a signal and noise ratio greater than 10 dB is irresistible. As you can clearly see, the ice shelves themselves pop out, which is expected because you have that ice ocean interface, which should provide a very strong reflection in uh, comparison to frozen bedrock, for example. Showing this right before it goes to the summer region, you can see the decreasing SNR as the sun starts to go below the horizon for the majority of the day. Meaning that in this case, passive sounding is no longer a technique that can work for the majority of the ice sheet, but still has some potential for the ice shelves. So to conclude the first part of my talk, I want to show again how passive sounding is a potential cost-effective measurement to enable continuous monitoring at the ice sheet scale. Once this technique is miniaturized and scalable uh, at a very large production rate, you can have a technique that just deploys very small systems that don't require the need to transmit these powerful electromagnetic signals in order to obtain these ice sheet measurements along the parts of Antarctica and Greenland that I described. So for the second part of my talk, I'll discuss the implications of this technique for the analysis of a passive HR radar system that potentially uses Jupiter's radio emissions for different mission concepts, such as studying the icy shell of Europa, which really, if you think about the uh, motivation for this technique, uh, stems from the Europa, Clishen, Europa Clipper mission, where um, there's been some uh, interest in potentially using passive radar sounding that can use Jupiter's radio emissions. Now, why would we want to do this at all? Well, if we think about the reason instrument, the radar for Europa assessment and sounding, ocean and near surface, has both a VHF system at 60 megahertz, as well as an HF system at 90 megahertz. Where the 60 megahertz system is interested in studying both the near surface features, as well as the near, sur um, the near internal structure of the icy shell, such as chaos terrain and potential uh, water storage systems. And the HF system is interested in trying to probe all the way down to this ice ocean interface and potentially detect the global subsurface liquid ocean. Now there's one potential uh, issue with this technique. The Jupiter's radio emissions is a powerful radio noise source in the HF band. So I, I talked about how this HF source is at nine megahertz. If you were to look at the Jupiter's radio emissions, and the detected ranges of Jupiter's radio emissions, it's roughly nine megahertz to 13 megahertz. So if you're on the subjovian side and Jupiter's magnetosphere is interacting with the Io plasma torus, it can produce these very large decametric bursts that are five orders of magnitude above the galactic background noise. 
So if you were to take, say, an image of your expected active sounding case, here shown by Christopher Grectos, uh, and you're looking at, say, a near surface feature or trying to look at surface properties, if you're con to consider the case where Jupiter is on and blasting its loud radio source, you could treat it like a jammer, where now you can no longer detect those surface features that you care about. So instead of fighting Jupiter's radio emissions, one of my co-authors suggested potentially using Jupiter's radio emissions as a source for passive sounding of Europa. And the technique works very similarly to what I've described before. You have your receiver on a spacecraft here, receiving Jupiter's direct path, as well as the path that reflects off of the ice surface, as well as the ice ocean interface. And then using the same autocorrelation based technique that I described, you can extract both altimic metric uh, measurements for the surface ranging, as well as this ice ocean interface here. Now to simulate what this might look like, I'm showing now passive SAR simulations for the Europa mission, defining a sensor geometry with the incoming Jovian burst plane wave, as well as a receiver that's flying above the surface. And it's gonna receive these reflections coming off of the surface. Here's an example of a synthetic DEM, which I would want you to keep this ridge in mind because we're gonna to try to recreate this ridge. And this is the long track of the ridge uh, for our sensor geometry as it flies over. Some of the experimental parameters for the simulation uh, using again, that nine megahertz system with a one megahertz bandwidth. In this case, we're gonna use a very short integration time because we want to have passive sounding comparable to say an active chirp length and using uh, in this case, a back projection technique to focus the signal to a very small facet. So it's gonna delay in some, everything within this Fresnel zone coming from the reflections in order to focus and improve the signal and noise ratio of a particular scatter. Showing an example of the active radar sounding simulation. Again, we're trying to recreate this ridge, which you can easily do with the active radar system, which makes sense but we wanted to highlight how this could also be used for passive sounding as well. So here I'm showing the range compressed image because we're using only 100, meg 100 microseconds for our integration time, we can barely recover the surface, but that's okay because we want to highlight the effects of the synthetic aperture radar imaging and how we can use this to both increase the signal and noise ratio as well as improve the azimuth resolution. Again, this is very important for showing the ability to resolve surface features uh, at Europa. So now that I showed that this can uh, recover the surface, this also highlights the potential for using passive sounding to characterize Europa's ion sphere, where a passive HF radar alongside a VHF <laughs> radar could serve as a low resource approach to correct for ionospheric dispersion, such as signal delay and pulse broadening. The technique would work similar to before, receiving the direct path, as well as Jupiter's ray emissions that propagate through the ionosphere, reflect off of the surface, and then are received at the system at a delay time later. Now, looking at this ionospheric dispersion in more detail, uh, Cyril Griebma showed the effects of both the delay and pulse broadening. So here you're looking at the time delay introduced by the dispersion uh, from the ionosphere for both the 60 megahertz case, as well as the nine megahertz case as a function of the altitude and is showing that there's significant delay time, especially for the lower HF band. Looking at how this impacts the range resolution in terms of pulse broadening, these vertical lines correspond to the ideal measurement for both the 60 megahertz system as well as the nine megahertz system. And this broadening here corresponds to the range of expected electron profiles, where in particular for the nine megahertz system, this pulse broadening means that your range resolution is severely suffering and would uh, severely degrade your ability to resolve near surface features. So one way to look at this in particular is by modeling both the VHF radar as shown on the left and the passive HF radar as shown on the right, where again, this uh, blue shows the ionosphere or no ionosphere result and the red shows the ionosphere result where you can clearly see the relative delay time as well as the broadening in the main lobe that's introduced by the ionospheric dispersion. On the right, I'm showing the passive HF peak where the simulated uh, ionosphere free result as well as the ionosphere result, where again, you can see the pulse broadening, the relative delay time delay, as well as a decrease in your signal to noise ratio. So all of these effects are really important because they degrade your ability to detect those surface features, as well as have accurate altimetric measurements. But we can use a reference-based approach and the relative delay time 
between the active VHF as well as the passive HF to estimate the total electron content in the ionosphere and then uh, compensate for that dispersive phase shift in order to correct our expected range profile. So here on the right, I'm showing the charge free result in blue, the ionosphere result <coughs> in red, and then the corrected result after a full, uh, in <coughs> using that phase shift compensation, where you can see now after we use our ionosphere correction, we have the expected range profile, which is great if we're trying to get accurate altimetric measurements to less than three meters of range error. So now showing that uh, as a function of the total electron content and the integration time used for the passive radar system, we found that for all realistic values of Europa's ionosphere, the passive HF can be used to estimate the total electron content um, shown on the left, as well as correct this range error to less than three meters for altimetry and accurate sounding purposes. And because of the various pathways of Jupiter's radio emissions due to this change in incidence angle over a flyby, we could potentially use this also to invert the latitudinal and vertical structure of the ionosphere during a given flyby due to these wide range of instance angles. We're here on the left, I'm showing the passive off Madeira geometry. And then here on the right, I'm, totally, I'm showing this uh, total electron content error as a function of the angle of incidence, uh, as again shown on the left, as well as an ionosphere eccentricity parameter, which is used to model the daytime and nighttime effects. And if you're to think about what an ionospheric eccentricity of zero means, it corresponds to a completely homogeneous ionosphere, which in this case shows that passive sign could be used for a wide range of instance angles. But then as you start to increase this ionospheric eccentricity and make it more inhomogeneous, it starts to reduce your usable angle to roughly 15, K, 15 degrees in the case of Europa's ionospheric eccentricity. So now that uh, I showed this is possible for uh, passive sounding at Europa, my lab is interested in pursuing more radar signal processing techniques, going forward, looking at more passive radar system designs and testing, looking at modeling passive radar performance, and then potential application for different mission concepts. I'm gonna show a few examples now in more detail. One looking at the signal processing development, I'm really interested in trying to recycle not just the sun source and Jupiter source, but other anthropogenic sources. When we think about FM radio stations, TV stations, GPS, all of these signals are available to be used potentially for studying the Earth system as a whole. I'm also interested in improving signal processing techniques, such as passive star imaging, potentially applying deep learning algorithms for the incoherent source case, and then looking at adaptive radar signal processing techniques, such as the one that I'm about to describe, that's direct signal suppression. So one example is this direct signal suppression problem, and it really comes down to this direct path in addition to the radio frequency interference, is a strong source of interference for the passive measurement. If we were to think about the direct path, it's much greater than a reflected path. And so if you were to take the autocorrelation of both, you can see that's roughly on the same order as the passive measurement itself. So if you were to take the autocorrelation before applying this direct signal suppression signal processing approach, you can see you have a relatively low signal noise ratio, but we showed that after applying direct signal suppression, you can improve this in order to again, get a better estimate of your echo peak in terms of relative uh, delay time and increase the extent of passive soundings spatial coverage uh, for monitoring ice sheets. Now, one of my students, Antonio Salapru, is working on optimizing this technique uh, using different parameter search methods in order to improve this direct si signal suppression technique and isolate multiple returns coming not just from the bed reflection in the simulated case, but internal layers as well. Another problem I'm interested in working on and working with uh, Chris and Nesley, a student in my group, is looking at Jovian burst demonstrations uh, using echo detection. So recreating that big Sur and Death Valley experiment that I showed before, trying to use a uh, very similar software-defined radio setup for detecting both the direct path as well as the reflected path of Jupiter's radio emissions. Here on the right, we're starting to look at, okay, well, when is Jupiter available? And fortunately, it looks like it's available at midnight and later in the night. So that's going to be interesting trying to perform this experiment because the sun could potentially interfere with our measurement at that time. Now, one of the products of this, um, this demonstration is also looking at uh, designing the experiments. And one of the situations we had to consider is making sure that we satisfied the spatial coherence constraints. In this case, I wanted to highlight the sun case for Earth to show what I mean um, by spatial coherence limitations. 
So if we were to look at the maximum usable altitude for passive sounding as a function of both the wavelength and the bistatic angle, because of the source spread of the sun, this means that the maximum usable altitude for passive sounding is below 10 to the zero or 10 to the one or 10 to the two kilometers. So this is really <clears throat> important for determining, again, that maximum usable altitude and shows that for the case of using the sun at Earth, we're limited to ground-based experiments. Looking at the pulse broadening effects as well, very similar to the ionospheric dispersion, but in this case, we're considering the source size. You can see the number of delay smears or the pulse broadening over the number of samples as a function of both the altitude and the bistatic angle. So in this case, you can see that again, pulse broadening limits passive science approach to really low altitudes, meaning it's probably more suitable for ground-based systems. But this also highlights the importance of improving the Jovian burst technique as well, and using Jupiter's radio emissions and other sources for passive sounding. And then a final example of a project I wanna highlight um, is work done by Andreas Casillas in collaboration with Christopher Verecos here at UTIG. And this is analyzing the uh, Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter Shallow Radar or shallow uh, Sherrod Solar Radio Burst Candidates for Passive Sounding at Mars, where <laughs> Chris has I, uh, established a list of uh, solar radio bursts that have potentially been direct detected by Sherrod uh, using observatories such as Stereo A and Stereo B. But there are some solar radio bursts that are potentially missing. And so my student is interested in studying these radio bursts that have been detected and the radio bursts that haven't been detected to try to identify reasons, whether it's the antenna orientation, the spacecraft, or just the solar geometry or solar radio burst physics in general for why we're not seeing these solar radio bursts, which would have huge implications for both passive sounding at Mars, as well as passive sounding with extended bursts from space-based systems. And finally, I'm interested in miniaturizing and having this technique ready at projection ready scale. So we can enable things like array-based passive sounding imagers. Again, having large arrays with very small systems that have low resource requirements. Looking at very long offsets as well, very similar to what has been done with passive seismology, where they use large cross correlations to identify properties of interest and study internal uh, terrestrial properties. And finally, infusing very small passive sounders into space systems, such as what's been done for Sunrise or Cygnus, where they use both the sun, observing the sun signal, as well as looking at signals of opportunities such as GPS. So to conclude, starting from theory simulation and lab bench testing, my research demonstrated passive radar sounding using the sun as a radio source to measure ice sheet thickness for the first time. Passive sounding could enable continuous and widespread monitoring of Antarctica's and Greenland's subsurface conditions and serve as a low resource sensor to probe the icy moons of Jupiter. And finally, my current research focuses on providing a richer understanding of the technique by projecting ambient noise passive radar performance and potential limitations when designing future radar sounding missions. And with that, I would like to acknowledge all my co-authors and collaborators on this research for all their support. And thank you for your time. And I'm ready to take any questions. Uh, uh, questions for Sean? Christopher. Oh. Um, yeah, I have, a, I have a couple of questions. Um, you know, in the first experiments that you have shown uh, on the um, uh, both both on Death Valley and uh, the one that looks at the subsurface in uh, in in uh, the ash sheets, um, if I saw the plots correctly, uh, you have you have a very sharp uh, peak when you have these uh, these uh, reflections there. It's basically only one sample, whereas when you have roughness, I would have expected some sort of spread uh, actually. So, could you explain a bit more um, these uh, these uh, data? Yeah, so the question is regard to roughness and the spread. We, we did check the spread. This is actually a couple of samples along both sides. Yeah, it is a very sharp peak. That is actually what we expect because we're matching white noise. But we did look at the roughness and simulate that as well, and it matches what we expected. Okay, okay. because uh, one of the things that I was wondering, uh, you know, now with active sounding, we start to get a pretty good handle on how, you know, how subsurface roughness can affect the signal. and. Um, when I was doing my own simulations on passive soundings, I saw um, I saw a bit of difference there. And so, um, I mean, 
I was wondering if these kind of actual experimental data could, uh, okay, it could uh, highlight some of some of the differences you have because, of course, in passive sounding you have a whole different waveform than these sort of things. The signal to clutter ratio becomes very different. Uh, but um, okay, then I mean, if if that is something you have uh, you have uh, you have considered, I will uh, I will look into the papers in in detail then. Yeah, great, thank you. And I'm also interested in seeing your simulations of yeah. the okay. yeah passive sounding, especially with the roughness. And um, the other question I had, if I uh, if I may, um, the um, uh, the limitations in passive sounding that you infer from the source spread mm. is it uh, is it for autocorrelation passive sounding only, or is it both for autocorrelated or cross correlated signals? You know, when you when you record the signal of reference and then you shut down the radar, whatever happens, and then you record the reflections and you do the cross correlation between the two instead of autocorrelating the whole signal. Do you still have this sort of limitations or is it a different case? That's that's a great point. So this is asking about the source spread and the modeled source yes. spread. So I wanted to show a few more cases and it's very similar to what you're talking about. There's a difference when thinking about how these were generated, which is from the von sieder zirke theorem and thinking about this problem from an interferometric standpoint versus a cross correlation standpoint. And that's actually something that currently we have in review where we know some differences with an autocorrelation and cross-correlation approach versus an interfered metric approach, which is what this is modeling here. So we've actually been able to show in simulation that we're able to get better maximum altitudes than what is shown in this case. So we're interested in looking in that more. Thank you. And thank you again for this uh, great talk. Thank you. My next. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for the, the nice talk. I was wondering how strong of a radio source do you need for this approach to work? I guess I'm thinking like if we had like a landed mission on the asteroid series, is this something that we might be able to use there? Yeah, that's that's a great question. So it's the questions about the strength of the source. If you're to look at some examples that I show for this source case. In the Jupiter's radio mission case at Europa, this is five orders of magnitude greater than galactic background noise. That's a great example of this being a very strong signal. If you're to look at the sun case that, uh, that I modeled here, what it comes down to is your maximum integration time. Because you're receiving noise, and this is something the passive seismology community does as well, when you're receiving a noisy signal, if you can receive it for a longer time, that gives you a better estimate. So it comes down to what is your maximum integration time in that scenario? Because in this case, our sun signal, you know, 10 to the minus 13 volts squared over hertz, that's really low. And it's actually below the background noise. But because you're able to integrate it and receive for a very long period of time, you can get away with that and resolve an echo peak that's above the noise floor. Uh, yeah, I have two questions, um, and they're at opposite ends of the solar system. Um, for the total electron count, um, I always try to follow this, and but I never get a feeling for the potential resolution, um, you know, to use it for plume detection. Um, you know, when we have a big old when we have a big old batch of neutrals in the total mm -hmm. electron count, you know, are we going to be able to catch it given the plume sizes that we've seen from Hubble and stuff like that? That is a question that I'm, I'm not sure about because, again, this range resolution, uh, as we see, you know, very significantly. So I'm not sure about the resolution of what we can attain. Maybe it's better. I mean, it probably would be better for the 60 megahertz case, but for the 9 megahertz case, you know, you wouldn't be able to resolve that. It definitely depends on the size of this, of your plume, and how it compares to this, in this case, 15 meter range resolution, and if you think you're able to. Yeah, okay, so you're as confused as I am in yes. terms of putting it all together. Great, that makes me feel a lot better. Uh, and the next one is, um, you know, looking at the, uh, you know, at the Antarctic, at the Antarctic source, uh, source leverage, let's call it. It looks like um, ice shelf monitoring would be the first, the first, first high, high science priority target. What do you, what do you imagine, go to Antarctica, I think it's better, because the, the melts, yeah, the ice shelves light up. And so, uh, what do you what do you envision for actually getting out there and getting enough um, getting enough receivers to watch the ice shelf change over the course 
of a, over the course of a summer of the irradiation. Is it balloons? Putting them on the surface is tough. You could put them out there a couple of different ways. And I know you've thought about how fast they have to move or how slowly they have to move to basically get, you know, get the signal to noise. So what's in your head? Yeah, I think it'd be a multiple stage approach. So, you know, continual testing on the Antarctic, in Antarctica, as well as looking at deploying maybe for one season, like, you know, one or two sensors, then coming back, you have something that's even more miniaturized, lower resource, uh, potentially just leaving out a hundred sensors, either doing cross correlations between sensors or looking at each individual sensor. And then finally moving towards either a balloon or drone based approach. Um, balloons, yeah, since they're moving you know, slowly, you could get away with longer integration times, which could increase your signal noise ratio. And that'd be a really interesting application. Of yeah, just starting the balloon sounds like a really pretty good idea. Yeah. Until they blow away, but they might blow to where you want to go, you know? <laughs> Who knows? Okay, thanks a bunch. Yeah. Benjamin's next. Thanks so much. I uh, Same slide here. I just was wondering, could you remind me um, what is going into this calculation of the signal to noise ratio for the ice sheets? And do you expect besides the obvious like the sun uh, amount of energy you're receiving changing through the season, how are things like the development of surface melt or subglacial melt and that moving around in the system impacting the potential signal to noise ratio at a given site? over the course of one deployment? Yeah, yeah, so the question's about, you know, what's going into the simulation. I talked about uh, this ice sheet attenuation model uh, developed by Winnie Chu, that went into this. The reflection losses, here I'm showing a specular reflection case. Uh, that's an ideal case. And then the transmission losses correspond to the geometry where the sun is, uh, say, directly overhead, which won't really happen. It'll be more like 30 degrees because of, you know, the region. Um, and then this azimuth integration time, which is a gain factor due to, okay, as the sun is a moving reflection point, how long is it observing a particular Fresnel zone and able to give you gain over that area of interest? So that, that's one part of the calculation. And then the final part is, okay, combining all this to get a maximum integration time using that for a particular bandwidth. In this case, I use a bandwidth of 15 megahertz because that matches our system model but you can increase that effective bandwidth uh, depending on your receiver's capabilities. And the other thing I want to note is I'm showing a very optimistic case, I would agree, showing that specular reflection. We did some more cases that are much more conservative as well as you know, the pessimistic case. So if we were to say, consider frozen bedrock, you know, this reduces your signal noise ratio, as well as you were to consider frozen bedrock and heavy diffuse scattering, this would also further decrease your signal noise ratio. So all these things are uh, something we've taken into account. The thing you mentioned at the very end about the changes in the near surface, the meltwater, that's something that is not considered in this model. This is just you know, a generic model that's considering these other parameters. But that's a very good point. Thank you. Thank you so much for your talk. Uh, I, have John a, was, oh, oh, I have a question yeah. from Zoom. It says, is the plan to leave the receivers in Antarctica for an extended period of time? Is snow cover and or winds an issue? Yes. <laughs> uh, so if I go back, if I go back to, you know, what happens with, with leaving these exposed after a long period of time? Yes, those are those are definitely an issue. But the idea is, okay, these systems shown here, these active current systems are much more expensive versus once this technique is fully miniaturized and ready, you're talking about a cost decrease of roughly, you know an order or two orders of magnitude less. So systems that could be developed, say for 50 to $100, that if you lose that system, it's okay because it's much cheaper than what we currently have where this is, you know, is multiple, either over 10,000 or $100,000, depending on how much resources you have available to you. I had a question. A couple of field camps in Antarctica, we used a uh, GOES, uh, satellite with the wobbly orbit to do an email link. Uh, is it possible to mount one of these sensors on a geosynchronous satellite with a wobbly orbit? <laughs> yeah, I think that's the ultimate goal. So the question was about having this on say a geosynchronous satellite. I, I definitely agree. I think that's the ultimate goal. Again, going back to, you know, once this is fully ready, we have a low resource sensor, you could have a space-based measurement. 
we would have to consider the source spread as I was showing that maximum usable altitude. But if you could have something geostationary to give you a very long integration time, that would also improve your passive radar sounding measurement performance. Thanks for the great talk. Um, so have you done any tests or are you planning on um, having the sensor like above the ice sheet, either like up in the air on a balloon or on the side of a cliff so you can see the direct one, the one that reflects off the top of the ice and the one that reflects at the bottom and then like trying to see how the relative amplitudes are and comparing that to your Euro case? Yeah, that's that's a great question. So everything I've shown has been, you know, resting on the ground. I haven't shown the sensor, you know, flying on a drone or a balloon, for example. Uh, I think that's a great next step as well. We've simulated what that looks like, but I don't have those results here. But I think that's a really interesting test as well to see what that looks like, to have some altitude and some uh, something with multiple reflections. I will say that's related to uh, this student's project where we're taking this from a single reflection and then looking at, multiple, looking at multiple targets and being able to isolate those targets. So in the example you were describing, isolating the you know, direct path, the path coming from the surface, the path say coming from an internal layer reflection, and then the path coming from the bed of the ice sheet. Yeah, totally related to this project from a signal processing standpoint, not necessarily from a field testing standpoint yet. Hello, uh, you kind of just addressed it, but my question was about how, um, so you show, you've shown that you can detect like ice thickness of like, like the whole ice sheet, but have you been able to resolve individual layers? Yeah, in our current measurement, we have not resolved individual layers and that's due to the very low signal to noise ratio that we have. And yeah, just like you were just describing, this is why we're trying to use this technique of uh, direct signal expression to be able to resolve those features that give you lower signal to noise ratio and uh, trying to be able to resolve those smaller echo peaks. Thank you. Thorough? I'm not throwing <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to apologize. Thank you. That was great. Uh, we have to start. I, I would just ask one question for this uh, for this morning. but. Uh, and I think that's a more or less a follow-up on Don's questions for the how to how to apply this in Antarctica. Uh, what is it possible to think of something that you have only one receiver on the surface and and you have like a, a mobile radio source that actually you know fly around like for example an airborne radar. You know, would that would that be actually useful? Yes, so the question was about a single receiver and then say having an airborne radar system. The answer is yes, because this is something that is very common, uh, especially in the military community, like having you know some bi-static radar system set up. And this is also something where, uh, I don't show it in this talk, but another student in Dusty's group, I worked with her and helped her develop a bi-static radar system that used an AP res system, and then, uh, which is the atomic phase radio echo sounder, uh, it has that as the transmitter, and then we would walk away with a receiver. And so separate, transmit, and receive, and use that for bi-static sounding, which I think sounds very similar to what uh, you're suggesting. Now, the bi-static system, you could also have it on an airborne system, and then that would give you uh, larger coverage as well. Any other questions on Zoom? Okay. <laughs> Take advantage of this, you know. Uh, so far, I think you have told about two kind of radio source, the sun and the Jovian cyclo cyclotron emissions. Is there, do you think of any kind of other radio source in the solar system that could be useful? Yeah, in the solar system, if there are any other radio sources that can be useful. If I go back to this image here with the radio sources, you might be able to use the synchrotron emissions. Those are pretty flat, but as you can tell, they're closer to the galactic background noise. So your signal noise ratio is gonna suffer. Uh, 
I've heard recommendations of looking at pulsars, but I haven't looked in detail of the strength of those signals and how they compare, as well as the geometry of those as well. So from a radio astronomical source standpoint, we focus mainly on the sun and Jupiter's synchrotron emissions and cyclotron emissions. But from an uh, anthropogenic sources standpoint, I mentioned that you know either FM radio or TV stations, GPS, LTE, those are all really interesting signals of opportunity that I'm looking to try to exploit for passive radar. Any other questions? I have a dumb question. If you're trying to do this on the moon, how good is Earth as a radio source? <laughs> the Earth as a radio source at the moon. I haven't, I haven't looked into the Earth as a radio source at moon, but I know that you know there's work with the mini RF community where they're trying to do bi-static radar of uh, looking at the moon's surface using a ground-based transmitter and then just a receiver on a spacecraft at the moon. So that's that's probably the closest thing to what you're describing, and it's definitely something that the community is looking at. Any other questions? Um, well, with that, let's thank um, Sean again for a great talk and a great series of pictures. And uh, Megan is coordinating lunch with graduate students in both.